human connection matters. And yes, that will apply in many different fields because if people work with people, then you want to know how people work. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. In this weekly show, I bring you in-depth conversations with thought leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs who inspire us to create ourselves into the people we want to be at work and at home. And now, let's get on with the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am thrilled that you are here. I'm also delighted and thrilled with this week's guest. He is a friend and a mentor and also one of my teachers, and we're going to talk some about that, I am sure, but I would like to introduce you to Tim David. Tim dropped out of college to become a traveling magician. Now he shares the secrets of human connection and influence with busy professionals in an entertaining way, both on the stage and on the page. He's authored three books. Tim, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks, Isolda. It is great to be here. This is a really cool opportunity to be able to chat with you in this context and uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. Me too. This is this is this has been a while in the making. I first heard about you from a, a, a another magician friend, uh, Eric Henning said, "You need to check out this guy's stuff." And I did and I have been hooked ever since. So, so I'm really glad that that I'm getting a chance to chat with you. I want to I want to go back a little bit at, at, to the beginning, if you would. You started as a magician. What got you started? What was it about magic that inspired you to pursue it full-time as a career? You know, uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Usually people just ask how I got started. They don't usually ask the internal side of it, what fascinated you about magic. So I don't really have like a stock answer for that. So this is, um, you know, that's, that's a good thing for me. I like to, I like to <laughs> explore that as much, uh, you know, as much as, um, you know, I'm sort of asking it of myself. And if I were to, if I were to be introspective, if I were to think about it, it would probably have something to do with being the youngest child. And everybody's saying, this is what you do. This is how it works. This is how to behave. This is how to think and stay in line. And the very nature of magic is about breaking the rules. It's about mm. breaking the laws of physics. It's <laughs> about almost being a little sneaky in that you know something that they don't, don't know and you're keeping that magical secret from them to make the illusion work. You know, maybe another wrinkle of that is my father was uh, used to used to be a physics professor, and um, you know before he he uh, was was uh, you know started working for the Navy to design nuclear submarines uh, for the Navy. Wow. But yeah, so um, you know that was my father. My mother was an accountant. My older brother went off to college, became a sound engineer. You know, works for Bose uh, speaker products. You know, designing some of their products and everything. So it's a very traditional straight laced, you know, go to college, get your degree, start your career, traditional path. And uh, again, for whatever reason, there is that part of me. And I think it's true for, you know, any real true sort of entrepreneur, that entrepreneurial spirit, uh, maybe was even born from just the desire to, I don't know, make my mark, stand out, be my own person uh, as the youngest of, of, a, of a, you know, successful traditionally uh, so uh, family. It's so fascinating that you say that, leaving your mark as a magician. I, I, I know lots of magicians, and you all love to bend the laws of physics. That's That seems to be the thing that, that <laughs> so many magicians, I, you, you know, you don't, you, this isn't supposed to be able to happen, and yet, and yet here it is. And so when you, when you're, when you were doing that, what, what about that was the sizzle for you? What about the, the work itself was the juice? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, relating to, to the topic of innovation here, I mean, that is the beauty of magic is that it starts on the premise that if it's not impossible, it's not worth it. It's, it's, not, <laughs> even in, it's not even interesting. If, it's, if it isn't impossible, then you can't create magic out of it. So we ignore all of the things that, that are possible. And I, I, I don't know if it's so much a you know, sort of a rogue rebel kind of mindset. It's more a um, problem solving uh, side of it that interested me. 
and you know kind of overcoming those those challenges and and really doing something doing something different i was very very shy i think most magicians share this part of our of our background is that you know incredibly incredibly shy me you know diagnosably off the charts shy and introverted i didn't talk till i was four years old i was you know social anxiety general i had all the diagnoses and, uh, you know, it was just a way for me to connect with people. You know, I started doing card tricks one day at indoor recess in middle school. And, n you know, nobody knew who I was. And suddenly there's a crowd of kids around me. And, and I think, uh, you know, that's a big, a big component of it as well. So, you know, you talk about the sizzle. It's, it's really a lot of those things, it, you know, wrapped into one. And it became sort of, uh, you know, this, 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 uh, yeah, it's the way to to achieve all of those things. Uh, you know, Daniel Pink talks in his book Drive. You know, what really motivates people, and uh, you know, this is is one of those things, and that is being able to master something. And you know, the other element, the other wrinkle that magic brings is it's a skill. You know, you have to learn it, you have to practice it, and you have to get pretty darn good at it if you're going to fool the human eye and the human brain that has been you know, looking at things for all of its life. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's definitely it gives, you know, gave me that opportunity to continue to learn and grow and get better and get better and develop a skill and try the impossible. And uh, I think that's really what it, what it boils down to for me. That's, that's the sizzle. I love that answer. And it's so fascinating to hear you talk about this the energy behind what you're saying is so I love this stuff and it's so wonderful to talk to someone who you know whatever it is you're doing now you spent time doing something you really love and i think that's great i remember i had brian glow who's another magician on the show and he said you'd better love what you're doing because you're going to be doing it a lot and that was one mm -hmm. of the reasons for him that he kept with you know that magic stayed such a big part of his life and it's the same he was shy also and what do you think that's all about that this idea of someone who's introverted and shy seeking connection through something that is very obviously not in appearance introverted and shy i'm out here and i'm doing magic and i'm you know as we said bending the laws of physics what do you think is the attraction there how do how do people who are shy and introverted seek and get connection through something that is very obviously a performance you know, I think there are there, there are multi, there, there are different types of entertainers. There is the style of entertainer, uh, particularly in magic, that will say, "Look at how great I am! Look at how how amazing I am! I have the power." And and for me, it wasn't it wasn't that at all. It was look how cool this is. You mm -hmm. know, I've been I've been looking at this. I've been I've been studying this. And look what can happen if you just do this over here and do that over there. Look how look how awesome that is. And the introversion piece of it is the self-belief, hey, I am unremarkable, I am uninteresting, people you know, barely know I'm in the room, I'm quiet, I'm shy, but this is something that is, again, inherently interesting. I mean, you can show babies magic tricks and they will increase their attention and look at something longer because it's not... That's not supposed to float. That's not supposed to disappear. <laughs> What's going on here? So, um, so it just created automatic interest, and it and it still. I mean, to this day, it, it, that introduction starts with, you know, Tim David was uh, is an ex magician. That's that always grabs people's interest and attention, and it's always something that is uh, an interesting conversation piece, whether or not it's hey, what's the secret behind how. David Copperfield or David Blaine does this thing, or hey, what's it like to travel and do 350 dates a year? And you know, all of those uh, things that are just, again, interesting about it makes the non-interesting person uh, absorb some of that uh, interest and, and connection and be able to sort of step outside you know, myself. Because again, it, it wasn't about me, it was about, hey, look at this, look at this cool thing. Ah, that's, oh, hmm, there's so much to talk about here. So this idea of, hey, look at this cool thing. It's a sharing, if you will, right? That is that right. sort of the, great. So when you're sharing, and this sort of brings me to the next part of this, because you can tell I'm going to be pivoting all over the place. You took 
this skill, the talent and the skill and the desire to do magic. And you transformed it over a few years to becoming a professional speaker. How much of magic was in that transition? And how do you, if you do, still apply magic to your professional speaking work? Hmm. So I, I mean, it would be hard to put a number on it. It is one of those things that is just uh, a part of me. And I remember when I was making the transition and, and the transition was made out of necessity. It was a financial decision uh, and it was also a parenting decision. I had uh, my second daughter was about to be born. And after my first daughter was born, I realized quickly, hey, I, I can't be on the road for 350 days a year and be the kind of dad that I want to be. Um, some people managed to somehow make it work, but uh, for me, I just, it was a personal choice. And, you know, I, I, I knew I need to be able to make more money uh, or at least the same amount of money while working less. Mm. And, you know, speaking is, is something that I noticed as I was doing corporate events and entertaining at banquets and things like that. They would have speakers. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, she made how much? <laughs> wait, hang on a second. <laughs> She didn't have to carry around any trick boxes. She didn't have to travel or hire assistants. Or do, she just got up there with a microphone and made like 10 times what I'm making. This is crazy. So, I mean, it was, it was really, again, born out of that necessity. And the things that I took from magic to speaking, it does center around sharing. It's, you know, where is the magic in, in real life? Where is, what, what's the magic behind what makes you know, sales work or leadership work. And, you know, finding those secrets is very similar to, you know, finding the impossible things that a magician can do. So, uh, you know, be, and then the obvious, you know, stage presence and skills that I learned from, from the world of entertainment and, and having so much flight time on stage and being able to just have that skill of engaging an audience. So, you know, I, but, but I think at the end of the day, I, I love what you said it centers around sharing it, you know, I, I don't know, as, as an introvert, I, I'm just into, uh, I'm always kind of in my own head. I'm always intellectually curious about things and I'm always looking into things. I'm always reading a ton. And those things that I find uh, that, that really interest me, I, I like, I like to share. And, and those, those clients that I work with who have these amazing stories and these amazing success stories or these, these angles on how they approached uh, a certain problem or, or issue. I, I like to share that, you know, and, and obviously with, with permission and when it makes sense to do so, but you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's about finding those secrets and uh, the things that really make the difference, you know, the things that really turn the dials and uh, sharing those in an entertaining way. I think that's, I think you hit it on the head. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. That part of it makes all sorts of sense. You can tell I'm like, I'm fascinated by, by the transition itself. But also, there's something here in what you're saying that, that goes deeper, that, that goes further. And, and that to me is that idea of engagement. You know, as a, as a magician, you engage an audience in a certain way. As a speaker, is it the same? What do you do the same or differently when you are trying to, to be, because you have to understand, I, I mean, I wrote a book on, on communication and, and public speaking. And what I talk a lot about, especially for introverts, is knowing your role, like choose a role and be that role. And that will make you more comfortable. You're an introvert who decided to go into a kind of a, an extroverted seeming profession and then went even further and went, okay, I'm not even going to have tricks. Now I'm going to just be me with a microphone. How do you, if you have it, overcome stage fright? And how do you engage an audience with you and a microphone? What do you do? Mm. Yeah, so, you know, at, when I started, I definitely used magic as a crutch. I remember doing a 20-minute presentation, and I had three full-length routines. Uh, and, and, you know, it was basically 18 minutes of magic uh, <laughs> versus the, you know, <laughs> two minutes of actual content and speaking. There were loose connections. It was basically, here's a trick. Here's the metaphor, next trick. And, you know, so I, I still will perform uh, a magic, uh, uh, you know, performance piece as an, as an opener. Mm -hmm. And I do that 
again, partially to engage, partially, partially to get into my own, um, I don't want to say the word character, but my own, my own comfort space on mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and also because, you know, gosh, people, if I, if I don't, people would go crazy and say, Hey, where's the magic? I thought you're going to pull out a deck of cards. I thought, you, were, you know, what's going on. <laughs> so it was always uh, requested if I left it out. So I kind of, you know, open with it. Let's get this sort of out onto the, uh, the table. Let's get it out of the way, if you will. And, uh, and, and let's figure out you know what we can what we can learn from this what it what it means what the significance is but i think the biggest thing that i took away from being a magician and translating that to being an engaging speaker is the idea of mystery the idea that if i show you a magic trick and then i immediately tell you how it's done the magic is ruined I, I've made this mistake. People have begged me, how do you do that trick with the bag? How do you do that trick where the, you know, the thing floats? And then I tell them, and then they make a face like I just kicked their puppy. Like they, oh, oh that, like that's it? That's the <laughs> secret. I thought, I thought it was going to be something way cooler than that or way right. more interesting, but that's, that's, I can't believe I missed that. Now I feel stupid, but I'm also disappointed. So when I removed the mystery, the interest and the and the engagement i mean it, it it disappeared right so mystery is like candy for the brain the brain loves to try to solve a mystery figure out a mystery uh solve a puzzle uh you know solve a riddle whatever it is if there's some sort of mystery the brain loves to try and engage and solve that so when i speak i still use the components of mystery i don't reveal the the answer if you will to the question right out of the gate i will build it up and create that mystery much like you know any good uh, novel writer won't just tell you the ending right away you build up to the ending any good movie writer or script writer or movie producer or director doesn't just go right to the ending uh you know unless it's memento or whatever in the movie backwards <laughs> uh, you know it, they they build up that mystery and we don't want to know the ending it'll it would, it would sort of ruin it for us so i mean that's i think just a universal uh aspect of how the brain works and what interests human brains so that element of mystery has stayed with or without magic awesome again so many questions okay so here's here's the thing that i'm, I'm thinking about this idea of mystery and, and the way our brain comes up with new ideas and innovates. What do you think it is that makes people want to solve the mystery that makes people want to push the envelope when they when you were when you were innovating new new pieces of your show when you're innovating and figuring out new ways of teaching or new ways of doing what problem are you are you trying to solve a problem and if so what problem are you trying to solve and what do you think other people do when they are when they are in uh, in pursuit of the solution of of whatever problem they're trying to solve? What do you think that is? Well, I mean, I think you know that that's the different techniques of approaching problems and solving problems. Uh, there are many, and, and you know, books have been written. Uh, that is certainly a a wide and vast topic. But I think your first question of why why do people want to solve problems and you know I, I think it i think it comes down to what makes us successful as a species you know what what makes human beings work what makes human beings go forward and it isn't simply uh, you know saying huh that's weird let me move on it's huh that's weird how can i you know fix this challenge how can i overcome that how can i get this you know this source of food out of the ground how can i make this crop yield more you know results whatever whatever problem that we want to solve, uh, you know, that, that inherent drive and desire to solve problems and to come up with solutions and to, you know, just create and innovate and overcome is, uh, I think, I, I think just inherent in who we are, uh, again, as a species. And, and, and it's for our own survival and it's for our own sort of, you know, again, progress moving, uh, moving forward. And that's deep. I mean, that's, that's real deal. Like that's deep, deep in the brain. So, you know, these, these are the types of things. And again, you know, when I speak on, on the, the, the concepts of human connection and that sort of thing, I, I tend to really focus on, 
on people for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, people are my audience. Uh, but, but number two, you know, if, let me, let me give you an analogy here. If, if you wanted to design clothes for the human body, you would look at the human body and say, okay, there's two arms, probably need holes for that. Uh, <laughs> there's a head, let's put a hole for the head and the neck to go in. And, uh, you know, let's, uh, you know, so you, you look at what you're dealing with and then you sort of create. So maybe that's sort of kind of an answer to the second part of the question. Uh, how, do, how do I go about it versus how do other people go about it? I mean, for me personally, it really is looking at, okay, if, if it's sales, what is the customer? How does a customer buy? Design your sales process around that. Don't, don't start reading marketing. Start reading psychology and how the brain works and how buying decisions are made. You know, because it's, it's starting at the, uh, I mean, there's a template that's already there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's already there. All you got to do is sort of mold around, uh, around that. And the same, same goes for magic. You know, I remember one, one trick that I created and one of my favorite things to do is create tricks for magicians to try to fool magicians. And I mean, yes, it was, um, you know, it was a, it was an income stream for me. It was one of my first attempts at how can I travel less, but still earn money from magic? I know I'll sell my tricks that I created to other magicians. Uh -huh. And if you want, if you want to sell a trick to a magician, you have to fool the magician. You have to make the magician have that sense of mystery and say, Oh my gosh, how do I do that? I want to be able to do that. If they think they know how to do it, they're not going to buy your trick. So one of the tricks that I, uh, one of my most popular tricks was uh, originally I was trying to make something disappear. Originally it was a, a vanishing effect, mm -hmm. but I went through my creative process and I thought, okay, there are really like seven basic effects in magic. How can I use this vanish, vanishing technique to make something levitate? How can I use this vanishing technique to make something go through a solid object? And, and that's ultimately one of the, what ended up happening. I ended up, you know, it was basically putting, a, putting a, a quarter through a glass table and it, it just looks like it goes right through the table, fooled mm -hmm. a ton of magicians, sold a ton of, you know, DVDs back in the day. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's sort of a, a, another process that I use is let's take, let's take this process, let's apply it to this other area entirely. So, you know, between molding what you want to do around the template that's already there and already given to you, and, you know, in the case of business, that's a big challenge. I mean, the human brain is a complicated thing. It is, you know, 86 billion neurons and, and hundreds of trillions of connections between them. No two are exactly the same. It is changing constantly. It is a, uh, it is a wild place inside the human brain. But, you know, again, doing your best to understand that and, and craft processes around leadership and sales is, uh, is, is what I've dedicated my adult life to and, and solving those kinds of challenges. So we look at the template first and then the other, uh, the, other, the other process that I use is categories. You know, this is a category. How can I apply this category of knowledge or this technique completely? Just, I'm just gonna cram this square peg into this round hole over here and see what happens. And you know, let's move this way over here and, and try this. You know, and I, and I use that in, in business as well. I'll say, okay, this works really well in this industry. I've done a lot of speaking in the HVAC industry, for example. What are they doing so, so well that could be applied over here in the medical field? And it may seem completely out of left field, but you know, I'm up there and I'm just sort of giving my message and light bulbs are going off in the audience saying, oh my gosh, why don't we do this? So, you know, it's that, that sort of, uh, I mean, gosh, I know, like, like you said, we're pivoting, we're moving, we're going left, we're going right. But, um, but I love the question, how do you, uh, you know, come up with those ideas and solve those problems? And, and why are people even interested to do so? Uh, and that's just, I think, my personal approach to it. Or at least, at least, let me say it this way. Those are the two that have worked the best. There's a bunch of other ones I have tried, <laughs> but I think, I think those are the two that, that have kind of worked really, really well for me along the way. I love it. You know, it's fascinating to me listening to you. Uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in when you're talking about, I talk to people in the medical field and in the, the HVAC field, and it's always the same message. Is that true? Is, are, you, are you always talking about it? And if so, what is, what's the theme? What is the Tim David big idea yeah you know it, it it is and it isn't the big theme is really really simple you know the idea that human connection 
is important. Human connection matters. And yes, that will apply in many different fields because if people work with people, then you want to know how people work, right? So, you know, that, that is sort of the overarching theme. Now, I don't certainly don't stand on a stage on a Monday and deliver a presentation to a, um, a group of educators and then on Tuesday stand on a stage and deliver the exact same message to a group of funeral home directors. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't say the exact same words in the exact same order, but I think at the end of the day, the core of that message is, you know, connection is valuable and connection really is the path to, uh, to creating influence and creating the, you know, the leadership or the, the sales, uh, you know, the, the selling process that, that you hope to create. All those things really do center around leadership, getting people, even, even education is influence. Uh, parenting is influence. And, you know, if you, when, when you try, when you try to persuade, if persuasion is your goal, then typically the problem that happens is people begin to manipulate others. Hmm. However, if connection is your goal, then that's where true influence is born. So, so that's my message. That is, is what I bring to various industries and various audiences. And yes, it will change. Uh, we will focus for some groups on how to ask for something in an email and get it responded to and get the results that you hope to get and create that connection that you want to uh, create through digital means. Uh, and I might, you know, speak to another group and say, here is how you, uh, you know, one, one of my clients was a, uh, like a, a cosmetic surgery uh, facility, I guess. And, and they, you know, they wanted to know how do we welcome people in? How do we start that process? How do we do the whole intake process? How can we touch up our uh, intake process to create more human connection and, uh, and therefore more, uh, you know, uh, sales and generate more business and, and revenue. So, uh, you know, it all kind of, again, comes back to how do we work as people and how can we work together better, especially in our digital age. Uh, every, every time you finish speaking, I'm like, doggone it. He already answered the next four questions I was going to ask. Ah, so. <laughs> See, so that's, I, I am a magician. See how that there works? you go. <laughs> <laughs> you made time disappear. So, okay. So here we, here we are, we're talking about these, the, the importance of this. What are the benefits? What are the benefits of being connected? Whether you're a parent to a child or a teacher to a student or a salesperson to a customer, what, what benefit do you get? What, what do people get out of being connected to one another? I think people come to me because they want the benefit of increased influence. They mm -hmm. want people to buy when they sell. They want people to follow where they lead. Uh, they want people to listen when they speak. And the other benefits of human connection, again, because this is something that, uh, oh my gosh, I have uh, researched and read about and looked into and experienced and heard stories. And you know, one of, one of my favorite examples is when Harvard University set out to find the meaning of life. And back in, gosh, I think it was the 1930s, and the study might even still be going on today. It is the longest, most comprehensive, longitudinal psychological uh, study in history. $20 million have been invested into it. Hundreds of participants have been followed and studied and measured every possible thing that you could measure on a human being. And they didn't even know what they were looking for. So they just measured everything, everything, everything. How long they lived, how much money they made, um, you know, how long their marriages lasted or didn't last, what kind of jobs they got, how happy they were. They measured all of these things. They even did things like, hey, spit into a cup. Uh, we don't know anything about like DNA or anything like that, or, you know, we don't know, we don't know exactly what we're going to do with this, but just we'll hold it and we'll figure it out later. So they accumulated mountains and mountains and mountains of raw data. This is sort of the big, the first example of kind of, you know, big data that we uh, are so familiar with now. And, and they looked at everything and they found things like, wow, isn't it interesting? This group of people over here they earn an average of $171,000 per year, more 
than the people over here in this group who don't have that. Wow, isn't that interesting? Wow, isn't it interesting? Over here, this group of people are alcoholics at a wild rate compared to this group of people over here who are, are not. Uh, oh my gosh, crazy. How long? These people live an average of seven years longer than this group over here. And they're looking at all these different factors and all these different uh, categories. And at the end of the day, it comes back to one factor, one dial. If you can turn this dial, just this one dial, then all of those other things go way up or way down if it's a bad thing, right? The, the improvement in, in all of the other areas from lifespan to how healthy a marriage is and how long your marriage lasts to how much money you make to how happy you are and everything in between. And I'll sum it up with the quote from George Vallant, who was the director of the Harvard Grant Study. And he said, at the end of the day, human connection is the whole shooting match. The results are in, that's it, period, end of sentence. Human connection is the whole shooting match. The more areas in your life you can make connection, the better, full stop. That's his exact quote. So, you know, it is, the benefits go on and on and on and on and on. I think, I think people will uh, respond really well to health, money, and relationships. Those are, <laughs> those are the three areas that human connection can uh, can help you in, and I think those are, uh, you know, if you if you poll any any uh, any group of people, they'll say those are the areas that we want the fewest problems in. We we want no health problems, we don't want money problems, and we don't want relationship problems. Give us those three things, and 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 we'll be uh, we'll be in good shape. You said something that I think is really interesting. Those that it's it's like you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Satisfying mm -hmm. those makes makes everything you know better, if you will. But you said something uh, in your last answer that I've sort of stuck on, and that is you mentioned that we live in the digital age, and we are we're very connected digitally. Everyone is on this server or that server, playing these kinds of games, doing Zoom, whatever. We're recording this on Zoom for Pete's sake. So that is going on and yet is that connection is being digitally connected actual connection what quality does it have that is that is the same or is it completely different what are your thoughts on that yeah herein lies the problem right we we know the secret sauce we know the answer uh and and it's not just harvard there have been study after study after study that that points to uh, human connection as as that secret sauce and you know my goodness we 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 very often know what the answer is we very often know what to do and at the same time we don't do it so this age of of digital connection we're experiencing and and you know it's relatively new the, we don't have the same level of the mountains of data that we do for, for other areas because this is simply a, a new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have, we, have a, we have a lot now. We have a lot more than we did even five years ago. So, you know, what we're finding, and if I were to sum it up, I would say this. The quantity of human connection has skyrocketed. We are on this Zoom call right now, and I am grateful that we have the ability to do it. I have... The ability to speak to my nieces in Switzerland right now if I want and, and I'm in the United States so it is it is a positive thing the quantity of human connection has gone through the roof unfortunately what we're also noticing is the quality of human connection is coming down um, and once again this is not a opinion statement this is um, this is based on you know again evidence that we have uh, human empathy, for example, if you look at the chart of human empathy over the last 30 years, it, it plummets right around the same time that we, we uh, you know, started really proliferating the use of social media. Now, that doesn't mean social media caused everyone to be heartless jerks. What it, what it does mean <laughs> is that, you know, right, right. What it does mean is that there is this, you know, there is this correlation and it kind of makes you go, hmm, what's, what does that mean? Why is that happening? And, uh, you know, I think that there are a lot of factors that have uh, have to do with this, but I mean, we've all had the experience of trying to have a connection, trying to create a connection, trying to have a conversation with someone and they're glancing down at their, their mobile device. 
And it's like, oh gosh, we've all, we've all had that same experience of being on social media and trying to have a thoughtful conversation and someone just blasting away at a complete, you know, negative profanity, you know, whatever they just, it, it's so easy to be almost anonymous in, in one way. Um, it's kind of like road rage. You're in your car, so you don't feel like you're really affecting the other person. <laughs> like you're kind of, you're kind of sheltered from that whole thing and they're sheltered from you but they still see your finger and they're still affected by it. Uh, the same sort of thing happens when you, when you interact through a screen. It dehumanizes mm. a little bit uh, mm. the other person. So I think, you know, I think between that and just the general, um, you know, the, the, the addictive nature, for example, the, the, uh, of a mobile device. And, and I use that term uh, with, with extreme caution. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't think that mobile devices themselves are the problem. I don't think that the companies or the software developers are this evil, um, you know, scourge on humanity. I think it is an amazing tool that a lot of people haven't learned how to use properly yet. And that's, I think that's just the, the long and the short of it. It's, it's a great tool, but it, it kind of is using us more than we are using it. And, you know, a lot of people are having the experience that they're on their devices more than they mean to be. They're distracted by devices more than they need to be. And that comes at a cost. You know, that comes at a cost of, of connection. The, the more time we're on our device, the less time we're face to face and creating connections with people. Um, you know, think about what happens in, in a workplace. Uh, or what used to happen in a workplace <laughs> before the lockdowns and shutdowns and everything. People would come into a meeting and they'd all sit down and they would all take out their mobile device and scroll around and check email and wait for the meeting to start. And previously, there was a moment of, you know, boredom. And hey, you know, how is how is your uncle? Uh, you know, you talk to the person next to you. You create those tiny moments of, of human connection. And I think I think that is what we're losing first. We're losing those, those little moments while we're waiting a line or waiting for a meeting to start or, or simply you know, sitting around the house with, uh, and with, with your own family. I think sometimes we all have individual experiences instead of shared experiences. Or even experiential experiences, if you will. You know, the, the idea hmm. of standing in line in a, in a store with your cart you could be on your phone or you could be people watching or just looking mm. around and seeing what's there. So that, that I, I totally, I, I understand what you're saying and I agree with you. And I want to, I want to talk on something that you touched on because you've written a book on, on, on taking a break, you know, the seven day digital diet. So obviously you're doing a lot of thinking on this, but that sense of removal, it, it, it almost seems to me like when you're talking into a microphone, you're or looking at a screen there you're you're one you're once removed from the other person even if you're on the you know on facetime with them or whatever what what is the quality of that kind of communication mm -hmm. and are there ways to improve it especially right now with you know social distancing and all of that are there ways to improve in your mind how we communicate through the digital media well, uh, you know, the first part of the question, you know, you're touching on some, some ancient, ancient wisdom of being present and being mindful and, and how a device does remove you from the place where you are mentally, emotionally, uh, figuratively to wherever it is that your screen is taking you, be it email or Candy Crush or Facebook or whatever it is. So you know, it does take you out of the moment. It does remove you from that. And, you know, the lack of being present with the people that you're with is, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to see more and more negative consequences from those types of, uh, from that type of lack, lack of presence, lack of mindful, uh, mindfulness, lack of awareness, um, lack of acknowledging other human beings. I mean, how, rare is it for you know like when i walk into the room my kids like i have to force them i have to train them to say hi to people when they walk into a room because we're just we're literally just not even acknowledging uh 
uh, each other anymore if they're not in that uh, screen bubble uh, that we're in. Mm -hmm. So, so that's I think that's kind of that 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 first part uh, that you address. Now, the second part is what do we do about it, right? How do we how do we create better interactions either through digital media or 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 alternatively, what else can we do? So, uh, you know, I don't think it, you know email is inherently bad. I don't think texting is inherently bad. I don't think social media is inherently bad. One of the ways we can improve how we connect is by truly understanding and, and once again, looking at the other person and say, okay, what does this person need right now? What sort of message can I create? Because all I have at my disposal is words on a screen, maybe video, but usually it's just words on a screen if I'm texting, if I'm sending an email. So that removes the body language component that removes my vocal tonality component that creates a lot of space for misinterpretation in fact again a lot of studies show that text on a screen just sounds meaner and less caring if you than if you said the exact same message with you know with your voice or 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 in person so you know in the other study uh, dr albert morabian back in gosh was it 1967 at ucla when when he said, hey, you know, 93% of what we communicate is nonverbal, only 7% of the emotional content of what we communicate is the words that we say. So, you know, I, I've, uh, you know, my first book was called Magic Words. You know, when we look at what, what do words do to people? What does is, what is a word do to the human brain and how can we use our words smarter? So I think, I think that's the first thing that we can do is we can focus on the tools that we have and, and we have that 7%, let's maximize that 7%. If it's through an email, let's send an email with the words that are going to impact the brain of the reader in the way that we intend and not by accident. So that requires an understanding, not just of our own language and our own communication skill, but also it requires a deep understanding of the other person. And mm -hmm. Understanding, you know, I talk about this in, um, in my, uh, my second book, which is called The Four Levels of Influencing People. Um, but basically, we talk about the different levels of understanding, from understanding human beings as a general whole, like studying psychology, uh, that sort of thing, understanding a human being's culture and where they live, understanding sort of their tribe. So if you are a human being who lives in the United States but works at Google, it might be different than if you are a human being who lives in the United States who works at Microsoft or, or Apple or whatever. Um, uh, uh, you know, so, so that sort of tribe, that, that group that you're speaking into will affect uh, you know, your understanding. But no understanding is complete without understanding the individual themselves as well. So you know, a, a lot of sales books talk about this, the idea of listening, listening to the other person, and you can do so much easier now. Everybody's posting all the information about themselves on LinkedIn, on their social profiles. So just take a moment, do your, do your due diligence, get to know this person's, um, uh, you know, get, get to know people, right? Get to know the human, uh, the human brain as best you can. Get to know the culture that you're speaking into. Get to know that tribal group that you're speaking into and get to know that individual before you, you try to reach out or create any sort of uh, connection. And uh, it's not always possible, uh, but I think, I think these are some simple steps. Uh, but, it, but it does come back to not what new technology can we develop, not what new app will create better connection between people. It's the fundamentals of human connection. It's the way that the brain is. That's how you develop the systems and the process. You look at who we are as people, how we choose to connect, how we want to connect. And, and it starts with we, we want to be heard, we want to be understood, we want to be valued, we, we, we want you to get to know us, to understand, you know, we, 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 people want to be heard, valued, and understood. And I, and I think some of those um, are, are universal and, and will always be, regardless of the medium or technology. I'm furiously writing so that I don't forget the next question I wanted to ask you because that was very powerful. Okay, so people want to be valued and heard and understood. Is it? Okay, it seems to me that social media, 
is and and how we use it is in its infancy right it's only been around for what 15 16 years something like that really yeah, I, I, I use the analogy, the, the honeymoon period is, is over. Like we're just kind of past the honeymoon period. Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to be this really cool thing, this really new thing. Everybody's excited about it. Um, and, and now we're starting to sort of notice like, oh gosh, we're starting, starting to notice, oh, this person snores. Uh, or, <laughs> you know. We're, the bloom is <laughs> off the rose, right? <laughs> yeah, we're losing a little bit of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the excitement and the, you know, the newness of it all. So, yeah, I, I, that's, sort of, that's sort of where I think we are at as a species in our relationship to, uh, to social media. So if that's the case, if the bloom is off the rose, you know, if the honeymoon is over, how do we, how do we use what we have to dig for those connections? What do we need to do? Uh-huh. Like you, you, you wrote, as I said, you wrote a book on it. So I'm, I'm hoping that there is something that you can, that I, it, I don't, I don't want to say it's hopeless. I don't think it's hopeless, but, but what are the steps? Mm-hmm. How, how can we improve this, you know, now, now that, now that the honeymoon's over, how do we work on the marriage? I guess is yes. the, <laughs> yes. I love it. You know, the answer is not we get a divorce from technology. That is not the answer. The answer is not, hey, let's all take our phones right now and march to the river and throw them as far as we can and bury them in the sea. Let's go full Amish. Let's just do that. <laughs> let's all live in a hut, you know, or whatever. That yeah. is, that's not, we don't, we don't need to do that. It, it's not practical, A, and B, you know, it, it's not what we need. It isn't a retreat from technology. Technology, once again, isn't evil. We don't want a divorce. There are some great things about this relationship that we have with technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we also, like every good relationship, we need boundaries. We need to understand that this is a two-way street. And, and, you know, at this point, for many of us, not for everybody, but for many people, technology takes more than it gives. It, it is, it, it's, our devices are supposed to save us time. They're supposed to make us more productive and save us time and make us more efficient. And yet here we are, uh, you know, swiping and scrolling mindlessly and wasting hours down the YouTube trail or, you know, getting down that, that rabbit <laughs> hole of Reddit or whatever, whatever it is. Right. We, we end up wasting time responding to emails and people emailing us for stuff that is frivolous and, and could wait 20 minutes and we don't have to be pulled away from our dinner or whatever. So, you know, all of these uh, promises that technology had for us are still uh, viable. Technology still does and can and has the capacity to save time for us. It, it can. It, it has the capacity to connect us with one another. It really can. Not all screen time is created equal. So if my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter, or my 11-year-old daughter, soon to be 11, uh, is on TikTok and and making these dance videos and obsessing about how many likes they get and tying in their self-worth to the number of views and likes that they get, that's, that's... less healthy, if, if at all healthy, hmm. than them being on FaceTime with their grandmother. Sure. Because, you know, my, grand, my, my, my mother it lives in Florida. I live in Massachusetts with my girls. So they have the ability to connect on FaceTime. And that is a different, different use uh, of the technology. One of them is certainly more healthy uh, than the other. So my, my recommendation, and really the premise behind this, this newest book, The Seven Day Digital Diet, is the idea, again, of a, of a diet, not a fast. We don't, we don't just you know, stop eating food altogether on a diet. If any diet, by the way, recommends that you don't eat food uh, for <laughs> you know, forever, uh, it's a bad diet. You, you do <laughs> need to eat. <laughs> so, so this idea of a, of a diet is just being intentional about how we use our technology Mm -hmm. because very often we just get sucked into a habit or a pattern and it may or may not uh, really be in our best interests and over and over and over again i mean this book was sort of forced upon me you know obviously speaking about human connection in a digital age the number one question that i've gotten was either a how do i get off my phone Uh, how, how do i do this because 
I really love my phone. I, I do. I like it. I like what it does. And I really love it. How do I get it off? And the second biggest question that I got was, how do I get this other person off their phone? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> my employees are always on their phone. My kids are always on their phone. My spouse is always on their phone. How do I get people off their phones for a second? So, so that's where, you know, the research and, and, you know, I started just taking groups of people through, through uh, discussion groups and, you know, how can we, how can we do this and what are best practices? And I looked at some of, um, you know, what, what the experts are saying, but I also looked at once again, the human brain and, and what is it, why are we so attached to our devices? And, you know, I mentioned something earlier in, in our call way back when this is a, this is a callback to maybe the first five or 10 minutes of our call here. Uh, Daniel Pink, he wrote a book called, the, uh, called Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Really Motivates Us. What really motivates us to go on our phone? Well, there are three things that motivate human beings. One of them is autonomy. Another is mastery. That's the one I mentioned earlier. And the third is purpose. So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. That autonomy, that freedom to be able to do whatever you want. Guess what your phones let you do? Whatever you want. You can go on Google Earth and go to Egypt and look at the pyramids. You can reach out and, and connect with a friend that you haven't seen in a long time. You can look up pictures of anything you're interested in or curious about. It is complete freedom. Complete freedom to be able to do uh, whatever you want on, on your device. So that is very attractive to people and it motivates people to be on their devices. The second thing, mastery, uh, many of the apps that we use are designed to, to kind of tap into this. You know, I'm thinking of things like, you know, I mentioned Candy Crush, um, you know, any of those, those games where we want to get better at the game. We want to solve the next puzzle. We want to get to the next level. We want to master this particular skill. But also our devices can help us master a new language with something like Duolingo as a, as a language learning app. Uh, it, it can help us to master uh, you know, playing guitar if we're watching YouTube videos and learning how to play guitar. Or guess what? Magic. You can learn so much magic on YouTube. It's crazy. <laughs> you can tap into that sense of mastery uh, on, on your devices or through social media, through the internet, through technology of various kinds. Uh, the third one is where we have a bit of the challenge. The idea that we get purpose and meaning from staring at a screen. And this is the disconnect for a lot of people. We're attracted to the autonomy, we're attracted to the mastery, but we're, we're missing out on the purpose. So the crux of the seven day digital diet is to find something that is purposeful and meaningful for you. It can be big, it can be small. And to systematically and strategically replace some of your bad phone habits while keeping the good ones, right? Keeping the good parts of technology, but re re removing and replacing some of the, the mindless activities with something more purposeful. It is a fact of human nature, once again, that we do not remove habits. We replace habits. And your brain is going to want the autonomy, the mastery, and the purpose. And how you give your brain those things is a choice that you have. So without being intentional and sort of feeding your brain, your brain is going to reach for things that it perceives as being a solution uh, to those, those three needs that it has. So, so I think, you know, I think that's a big reason why a lot of people fall into that trap. And I also believe deeply that that's the biggest reason why people at the end of the day feel unsatisfied with it. You know, they don't, they don't go like, ah, oh, gosh, you know, the best thing happened today when I was, you know, uh, looking at a screen, I have the best story to tell you. I was sitting there staring at my phone. Like that, the best stories don't <laughs> happen that way, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, it, and, and it's crazy, but you know, from, there's a bunch of different studies who say a bunch of different things, but anywhere from, you know, four and a half to, I've seen up to nine hours a day that we spend engaged with a screen uh, on average, you know? Uh, and for teenagers, I think, I think the, the most recent study is something like seven and a half hours per day. And, but that's even out of date because with the lockdown, with the coronavirus, you know, it seems like our devices are even more prevalent. 
and we're relying on them even more. And suddenly we're developing these habits that even when the ban is lifted, even when, you know, a travel ban or, or even when, you know, lockdown is, is less stringent in, you know, and I know it's different in different parts of the country, but, um, you know, here in Massachusetts, it's pretty strict. Um, and, you know, even when all that stuff is lifted, we are still going to have the same habits that we've developed with our remote working, with our remote learning, with our, you know, remote socializing. And uh, not all of those habits are going to be good ones. So, so the idea of the seven day digital diet is to take, I mean, a week, to take a week, not to throw your phone away for a week. You're gonna to continue to use your phone for the week, but you're going to replace some of the unwanted phone habits with something that maybe even you didn't know that you wanted and or needed uh, from, from your life and your habits. motivating to do that what what would motivate someone to go okay that's it i'm i need i need a break i need to change things like if if we're if we're i don't know if addicted is the right word but if we're spending so much time so much screen time what's the breaking point what what do people get to or what what might we want to look out for when when we were ready to take this seven days and go, okay, let me become mindful in how I use my tech instead of mindless. What, what do you, what's, what's the point? Where do you find it? Yeah, I think there are different markers for different people. I think it might in many ways be an individual uh, breaking point. I have a few assessments that people can take on, on the website, the seven day digital diet.com. And, you know, that is uh, an imperfect tool, you know, but it gives people an idea. Some people want to know, where do I stack up in relation to others? You know, mm. do I use my phone more than other people? And I don't, I don't think that should be the metric. I don't think that should be the, uh, you know, where the breaking point comes from. I think the people who, who come to me, the people who end up either doing, you know, one of my, my challenge groups or, um, you know, just going through that that seven day digital diet process, either as a reader or once again, as, um, you know, a, a, as a, as a challenge group, it's, it's an individual thing. It's, they have their own reasons. They get to the place where they say, I'm sick of it. You know, I, I wonder, I wonder if it's, you know, possible to discover an extra 14 hours a week, uh, or more or whatever, you know? So I, I think uh, people have, either time motivation, people have connection motivation, some people have uh, money motivation, you know, where they want to be more productive and not be uh, distracted and not, uh, you know, distracted from their work uh, or, or distracted from their purpose, their hobby, their, their contribution to the world. Sometimes they feel like, oh, there's so much that I want to do, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just so tired and uh, it's back to words with friends on my phone. It's back to... Um, you know, uh, I'm just going to browse around uh, Twitter for a little while and, and, and waste some time. And, and they don't get their, uh, you know, their, their purpose fulfilled either. So, you, you know, I, I, I can't say other people's breaking points. The, the first chapter in the book was my breaking point. Mm -hmm. And it's a, uh, it's a pretty funny story. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's also quite embarrassing, but you know, that was, <laughs> I, I, uh, I still can't believe that I, that I put it in print and published it in a mass scale like this. Um, but you know, Hey, uh, one of the, one of the keys to human connection that I teach is vulnerability <laughs> and being willing to do that. So you gotta, you gotta practice what you preach, uh, as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's so timely talking to you about this. I'm going through a process right now where I am tracking religiously every minute of my day to see mm -hmm. where am I spending my time. And the reason for that is because I, I believe innovation happens when a creative has a to-do list, you know, that's, that's my overarching thing. And so I, I want to see where's my, where's my free time or where's the time that could be going somewhere purposeful, I will say, that might otherwise be spent on Instagram or whatever. And so this idea of wanting or realizing that you could be doing something else with your time, 
again, it comes to different places at different times, but you are speaking on it. You're out there working with groups about it and, and helping them develop their own more healthy relationship, I'll say, with their, with their tech. When you do that, when someone reaches out to you and says, okay, I've got a company where everyone's on their phone all the time instead of paying attention in meetings, what's the process for that? What, when you go in to speak to people about this, what do you do? How do you help them? Yeah, you know, that is certainly, I think, uh, more of an in-depth uh, you know, conversation than we might have time for. But, you know, it'll be, it'll be a mix of, uh, you know, the, the uh, live, you know, presentation where I'll, I'll get up and I'll create some engagement and some motivation in the audience to essentially generate the buy-in. You know, so so I'll come in as a guest speaker and I might be a luncheon learn. It might be, you know, part of an annual conference that they're having. And, you know, I'll I'll sort of kick off this initiative, you know, get get the ball rolling. But it really is, again, designed to get the buy in because mm -hmm. without anybody understanding, hey, why is this even a problem? You know, ooh, ooh, everybody's on their devices. I mean, that's that's one of the common sort of things that that. Um, you know, people res uh, use as, as, as resistance, you know, well, every, everybody, everybody's doing this. It can't be, it can't be bad. Everybody's on their device. Well, I mean, millions of people right now are sick from coronavirus as well. Like that's, or, or hundreds of thousands or whatever the number is in the States or worldwide. Uh, but you know, this is, that doesn't mean because so many people are doing it, that it's, that it's okay or, or that it's healthy. Um, you know, so nobody in, in, in the 1918 flu pandemic said, well, everybody's sick, so what's the problem? <laughs> you know, like, well, that, <laughs> oh, no, that, I, I doubt they did. Yeah, that, that, that is the problem. Right? Right. That is the problem. So, um, you know, so we create that buy-in, and then, you know, a lot of it really has to do with uh, that, that cooperative learning. You know, it, it, in the book, we, we give very similar process to what has worked with groups. I mean, people could literally take the book and and take their organization or their team or their family you know through this process and you know again seven days seems like a really short period of time to change habits um especially some as deep and 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 pervasive as uh, our technology habits have become uh but you know once again this is you know we, we have a lot of uh, a lot of um uh science on our side we have a lot of you know, trial and error, you know, on our side that, that has come through and said, okay, this is what's working. This is what's not, uh, what's not working. And this doesn't have to take years. You don't have to have a new year's resolution and take 365 days to try and figure this stuff out. You just got to do the stuff that works. You got to do this, you got to do that. And then you got to do this. And here's how you do it, you know, with other people, with this, with that. And uh, these are some tools you can use. Um, you know, I, I highly recommend tracking your time like you're doing as Olda. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, but you know, the short answer is there's a process and, you know, you go through the process and you come out the other side and one of, one of a couple things will happen. It'll, it'll completely work and you'll be completely quote unquote cured. And I have all these crazy stories of people who have gone through just a seven day process and, you know, they'll, they'll share the results and they're very, uh, dramatic results. Um, and the other, the other side of the coin is, you know, you might not have those results, but there, th then there's a process for, well, why not? What, what did you miss? What, you know, what do you do differently next time? Uh, is it worth trying again? Uh, you know, and, and you kind of just continue to, uh, what we call test monitor and adjust. So, so I think, um, I, I think the process and then the process for implementing the process <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is important. Fabulous. I love it. That's great. Well, I, 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 I could keep you for the next six hours and we could have a lovely discussion, but you know, we, I understand you have a life to get back to. I, I want to thank you so much for joining me and talking about this. I think it's such an important topic, especially as we look at our time management and how we, how we process all of the information coming at us, which is incredible. And, you know, you, you not only speak professionally, you teach other people 
how to speak professionally. So I'd love to have you back at some point so we can really delve into that process and what that's all about. Because folks, if you're listening to this, and I know you are since you're hearing me right now, Tim is amazing. He's got books that you need to, to read and you need to get in touch with him at sevendaydigitaldiet.com or getspeakinggigs.com. I'm going to put all this in the show notes. You're going to, you're going to want to find out what this wonderful person, his message and what he's talking about. So definitely find Tim and get to know more about the work that he's doing. I have just one question for you, Tim, that I ask everybody. It's a silly question, but it's the last thing I ask before, before I let you go. Are you willing to answer it? Sure, absolutely. In fact, let me um, let me add to what you just said about you know checking out the websites and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, more so than learning about me, I think you know people can learn learn about them. Like I said, one of the things that I have on uh, Seven Day Digital Diet is this assessment. You know, and because people are always wondering, do I is this a problem? Is this normal? Is this uh, an issue? Can this be improved for me in my situation? And uh, you know, check out a couple of those assessments just to just to sort of see uh, where where you uh, either stack up or you know or where what areas of improvement can be uh, can be made. Would you be willing to share the links directly to those assessments so I can put them on the show notes? I can send them to you. I actually have the site pulled up here, and it is sevendaydigitaldiet.com slash tests. There it is slash tests. That was so hard and complicated. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, yeah, and I'll put, I'll make sure that I put all that in the show notes so that if if you if you need if you need to lose a little digital weight, this is mm-hmm. uh, this is the place to go. That's very cool. So yeah. again, Tim, thank you so much. And here is the last question: If you had an airplane that could skywrite something, anything for the whole world to see. What would you say? Ooh, wow. That that implies not a lot. I mean, I guess it, I, I could I could have a, a a paragraph up there, right? I mean, it's the whole sky. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but but simple messages certainly uh, certainly stick better. And you know, for me, I think it would come down to three words, and they are prioritize human connection. Um, you know, it, it doesn't always prioritize itself. And uh, it's one of those things that, you know, if we do it, not only are we better off, but the people around us are better off. So, uh, I mean, what's, what's better than that, right? What's, what's more important than, uh, than, than the people in our lives? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of close with this story that, that I was told um, after a speaking gig. And this speaking gig was for a group of uh, hospice care providers, palliative care providers. Uh, these are the people who, you know, hospice is where you go when you know it, time is short, you're going to die. Let's just make them comfortable as best we can. So these people, first of all, they deserve a medal every single day. They mm-hmm. are heroes. It's an incredible, uh, they do incredible work and what an important role uh, that they play. But they also have a unique opportunity to um, to to hear people's stories, to hear people's perspective, and they say hindsight is twenty twenty, and these people are looking back on their lives. They are looking at it with hindsight, and none of them. I mean, these people they came up to me and they're like, you know, that your message really resonated. We we talked to these people, and nobody ever says like, hey, I'm about to breathe my last. Could you please go? Uh, back into my, my home office and get my college degree. It's hanging on the wall. I just want to hug it one last time. <laughs> you know, nobody says wheel me into the garage so I can just sit in my dream car. Um, you know, nobody, nobody, nobody says one more day at the office, please. That's all I want is one more day of work. <laughs> I just want to get in some more hours if I could, please. At the end of people's lives, when, when hindsight is crystal clear, 2020, they say, Bring me the people. I want to see this person. I want to remember the connections that I've made or the connections you know, that I may have neglected. And that's where their biggest source of happiness or their biggest source of regret comes from. And I think if it's going to be important then, I think it should be important now. 
and seen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree <laughs> wholeheartedly. It, and the sooner the better, because this is it, right? You know, every second you live is a second you've yeah. lived. And there aren't that there aren't that many left, comparatively speaking, right? For the, compared know, it, to the age of the sun. Yeah, it is crazy. I um, I spent a year volunteering at a suicide prevention hotline. So mm -hmm. I was I was the guy that people called when they were on the bridge or when they had a gun in their mouth or, you know, and they just wanted to, uh, you know, last ditch effort or or whatever. And it shocked me, shocked me. I, I even after studying this, even after knowing everything that I know about the importance of human connection. We had to we had to mark down on a, on a physical piece of paper. They didn't have their computer systems yet, uh, and this is just like two years ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they 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 do now. But um, we had to physically mark down like what is the reason, the primary reason, what are some of the, the the causes that may have led to this. And if you just flip through that book, I would do this in, in between calls. I would just flip back and forth, uh, go through all the different calls, and we took hundreds and hundreds of calls. And the, ch the, the column labeled loneliness mm. over and over and over and over again, it just, I mean, with a lack of connection, it literally takes people's desire to even live. So uh, that's what I'm writing in the sky is all the prioritize human connection, uh, no time like the present. And again, wholehearted, wholehearted agreement. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate you and your words. And I'm really grateful that you took the time. And I hope that you'll come back so we can talk about professional speaking gigs and all of that too. Because uh, again, so many questions, so many questions. Thank you again, Tim. I really I appreciate it. it. I really appreciate it. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I know you enjoyed this episode because Tim is, as you can tell, fantastic. If you like what you're hearing, please review the podcast, get in touch with Tim, find out the work that he's doing, and let me know about things that you're thinking about. I'd love, love, love to hear from you. Until next time, again, this is Isolde Trachtenberg saying, be kind to one another. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love.